Hello and welcome to Conversations with Chicago Collections Consortium. I'm Jeannie Long, Executive Director at Chicago Collections Consortium. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, Chicago Collections is a consortium comprised of member organizations that consist of libraries, museums, and cultural heritage organizations. Now we're all working together for the preservation and promotion of Chicago's rich history and culture. We do that through a couple different ways through the sharing of member archival collections on CCC free and open access portal, Explore Chicago Collections, and through free public programs like the one being offered here tonight, or this afternoon rather. Check out on our website at chicagocollections.org um, a listing of additional um, free public programs. We have an upcoming virtual public program offered with our member organization, Chicago Public Library here at Washington Library Center on March 9th, um, entitled Modern in the Middle. We'll be speaking with authors Michelangelo Zabatino and Susan Benjamin in conversation with Neil Harris and Terry Edelstein on the recent publication, uh, um, Modern in the Middle Chicago um, Houses from 1929 to 1975. But today I'm very excited to be speaking with Raquel Flores Clemens. Raquel is the University Archivist, Director of University Archives, Records Management, and Special Collections at Chicago State University. Uh, Raquel, thanks so much for making time for the call today. I know Chicago State has a, a rich collection, not only archival collection, but a rich um, founding history as well. So let's dive in um, right away and please tell us a little bit about um, uh, the collection and what you can um, tell us in, in terms of your holdings too. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for, for having me. And, um, and I don't know if I can, if, if I can um, have the camera on, but it can stay off either way. It doesn't matter. But um, so Chicago State University, uh, it is, um, it is a unique institution. It is 150, uh, over 150 years old, it's 153 years old. And as the university archive, uh, archivist, I'm responsible for the collection, um, organization, and preservation of its historical records. We also are the institution's um, institutional repository unit. So we uh, steward um, the, the institution uh, in, in, in terms of making sure that they are compliant with uh, st uh, the state, um, state uh, regulations and ma uh, mandates for uh, records management. And so um, through the work of the records management, that, that is what populates our historical collections, if you will, um, um, in addition to the historical records that have already been, um, you know, sustained. Um, Chicago State University's University Archives is actually pretty, when you, when you think about the institution's history being over 150 years old, it's actually pretty new. Um, it's only about 33-ish, the archive as a department itself is only about 33 years old or so. And so, um, but the, but just through, and, and many archives kind of start this way through the reference uh, libraries historically were just kind of keeping the the, the older records and um, the that became kind of the foundation, if you will, of the university archive uh, records. And then it grew, it has grown since then through the work of, uh, of records, manage, uh, records management when those active records then become, um, you know, no longer used and are deposited into the archives. So um, the, the records of the university reflect the, the, the institution's history and its values. Um, and the, and, and that also, kind of re reflects the broader uh, academic community of the institution. So the, the, our, our collections, um, both the university records as well as the special collection, encompass the areas of, of, of education, social justice, political science, health sciences, African-American history and neighborhood history. And that, you know, again, supports the, the university's mission of providing access to higher education for students from diverse backgrounds and educational needs, and, and really uh, creating a transformative um, space and educational experience um, committed to teaching, research, service, and community development, uh, which includes social justice, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to change the... There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's, come on, technology, stay with us. <laughs> so, uh, so the university um, was founded in, in 1867, and I'm trying to go back. 
So it was founded in 1867 and it was um, founded in Blue Island, which is right south of Chicago. And, um, but it then transitioned into what we now know as Inglewood and that's where it spent majority of its history. Um, it was first you know, founded as a teacher's college and, um, or a teacher training school at that time as many, um, many state institutions that started as teacher training schools started off you know, as these certificate programs that were issued um, and then uh, it developed into a teacher's college and, and many, like many other state institutions across the country, it was uh, a normal school. So it, it was Cook County Normal School for a good chunk of its history. Um, and I'm, I had a picture of the, uh, the early building, the first permanent building. Uh, but for some reason, the, the, it will not go back. So I'll just, uh, I'll just keep, it, keep it going because technology is being weird. I, but okay. Raquel, I don't think so, people you know, really realized how, you know, dating from 1867, um, you know, that, that long and rich history there. So. Yeah. So it was, was interesting too, is that it is Chicago's oldest, um, it, it was the Chicago area's first teacher training school. It's its oldest public university. So the oldest public university in the city. And it's one of the oldest uh, institutions of higher education in the state. So uh, ISU is the, is the oldest public institution, but in terms of, uh, you know, chartering the school, Chicago State comes in as, as second. Um, if you are talking about brick and mortar, then U of I beats it out by a few months. Um, and that, and, oh, I'm sorry, and that picture was its first permanent building, um, which was, um, that picture was taken in 1870. And the location on that building? So the, so the location of that building is, um, was in Inglewood. And then um, when it transitioned into, it stayed in Inglewood, it transitioned to um, um, when it became, you know, Chicago Normal School, then, then Chicago Teachers uh, College, which it was known for as most of its history. Um, it was at uh, the corner of 68th and Stewart for most of its, for most of its history. Right now, Chicago State is located um, at 95th and King Drive. And so we are slowly edging up on the, you know, beating out that, that old location, if you will. Uh, but for most of its history, it was in Inglewood at 68th and Stewart. Um, it is an institution of color. It's a predominantly Black institution and is one of Illinois' Um, um, uh, one of two minority serving institution uh, with a shared history of North, Northeastern Illinois University and uh, Northeastern Illinois being the second um, minority serving institution. Um, the, the shared history is that Northeastern actually started out of um, Chicago Teachers College, and then in the in the sixties, it turned. Um, you know, different different events happened where uh, a north north side location became Northeastern uh, Illinois University. Um, this, what's your enrollment today at Chicago State? So the enrollment right now is a, is a little bit over three thousand. We have uh, both uh, undergrad and graduate uh, uh, programs, and um, it is a largely non traditional student body. Um, most uh, of, of the students are um, uh, identified as, as, as African American or um, uh, Lat uh, Latino. So uh, that those are our two largest demographics, if you will. But also we have a, a, pr a pretty sizable international student population, and many uh, are head of household. Um, um, uh, both uh, a majority uh, women uh, head of household, and it's a commuter campus. Although we do have um, a, a dorm on campus uh, that uh, accommodates mostly undergraduate students, um, Chicago State also has a ranking pharmacy school, and it, it graduates one out of six African Americans with bachelor's uh, degrees in the state of Illinois. So that's quite um, an, an impressive feat, and it's definitely making a direct impact on community as well as the, as the state. So it was founded in response to a growing non-Black immigrant population um, in the 19th century. And, and again, it was for most of its history known as Chicago Teachers College. I'm not sure why I went to the other screen, but it's okay. So it was uh, you know, known as Chicago Teachers College. Um, and then as the, as the student demographic, uh, the student demographic started to change as the surrounding community started to change. Um, and so, and, and one thing I mentioned earlier that, you know, at the time there was, you know, racial tension in terms of in the community and how those things played out. And that actually kind of created a void in the university's history. So there's still a lot to learn about the university's history, especially between the periods of 1950, you know, 1970, during that transition when Chicago State was becoming um, 
um, a predominantly black institution. The, the, the institution as well as the neighborhood was impacted by what we now know as the great, great migration. Um, and, and, and so with that being said, it very much has a direct connection to this, to this rich history of not only Chicago, but black Chicago. And I think it's important to mention it because Chicago was founded by a black man. So we also wanna make sure that we're amplifying the presence of black people in Chicago's history. And it's currently located on the far south side of Chicago at 95th and King Drive. And it's between the residential uh, neighborhoods of Burnside and Roseland. So unlike a lot of other ins public institutions or institutions in, in the city, um, it's very much a part of the community. Um, it's, it's, it's largely remote, uh, removed from a, a, a lot of commercial um, uh, commercial uh, areas, although it's, it's, it's very, it's close to, uh, you know, the Stony Island uh, thorough, uh, thorough way and, um, and that sort of thing. But it's very, much a part of the community and the community does identify with the institution and use the institution. Um, the community knows that it's a state institution and so the community uses the library uh, quite often in other facilities. And Raquel, um, I know you do but the university does a tremendous uh, amount of outreach and, and incredible like public programs as well in these COVID times. Mm -hmm. um, what what has been happening in terms of those programs, you know, in terms of virtual offerings? Yeah, yeah, we definitely have transitioned uh, many uh, program offerings online. Right now, the institution, as many institutions, is, is running on a hybrid model. Most uh, courses um, and activities are done remotely. We the majority of campuses, you know, working remotely, although kind of a stagnant schedule to make sure that we are still readily available and open to the university. So the, 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 the library, most of its departments are open, but again, just the less people in, you know, in the space and um, most classes are offered online. The library itself is uh, open um, uh, Monday through Friday, but it is currently campus is only open to um, the university community. Um, and, you know, and hopefully um, with the change in COVID numbers, hope, hopefully, you know, we will be kind of a little bit more open to the public in, uh, later in the year, early next year. Um, but the library is open um, to, to uh, for library operations, if you will, um, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And so that uh, allows students to still, um, you know, receive their, you know, physical uh, uh, books and materials. And, um, but our, our, you know, reference services are, are, are done online. And then also the, the, uh, the archives, um, most of the services we provide right now are largely online, you know, just coordinating and working with, uh, with researchers um, externally uh, to, you know, digitize what we can to provide uh, research assistance. And then we, and then as far as the university community, though they have a little bit more access to the archives for the most part has been largely remote. So um, just a couple of quick highlights in the history. Um, again, it was, you know, it, it was a, a Chicago Normal School Teaching College. And the, the image that you see on the screen right now is actually of Ella Flagg Young. Um, she was, um, she, she's a noted figure in the history of public education, as well as Frances Parker. Both of them were noted figures in the, in the history of public education, and they are pioneers in progressive um, education. Um, Ella Flagg Young was the first um, woman to lead uh, uh, Chicago State. So, a president, but at the time, like most normal schools, they were principals in the early history of these of, of these sort of institutions. So she, although the title was principal, but, but it translates today as president. So she was Chicago State University's first president, and she's a, a, a noted figure as being the first woman to lead a a, a, um, a major a city a, um, a major city. Um, educational uh, system. So she was the first, you know, leader of CP, what we now know as CPS um, or Chicago, Chicago Public Schools. And so, um, you know, so again, we have this, this unique, uh, um, this unique history that ties directly into this larger narrative of public, of providing free education for, uh, for the public. And our, uh, our records are, you know, oftentimes, especially when people are doing this sort of research, they do reach out to Chicago State because of that, um, that, that, you know, taking part in that, that early history education. And then um, this, this um, slide here uh, demonstrates a couple of things. One, it, it demonstrates that, you know, um, at least in the recent years, the, the archives effort to, to start to bridge the gap and tell a more fuller story about what happened in those kind of missing years, if you will, in, in the university's history. Because if, if you were to look at the records, it, it would seem like there was no uh, engagement or involvement to the, uh, like the, the civil rights movement, if you will, during the time which we know, especially being a predominantly black institution and knowing that that transition happened at that time, that's bonkers. We know that that's there's a connection. And so a lot of that 
you don't necessarily see it in necessarily the, the a lot of the official records, but you do see it in this newspaper. So there was a, a newspaper for many years called The Tempo. And so that is where a lot of the university's history is and a lot of the, the student activities um, are, were reflected in there. But the, the interesting thing is because of that, that transition, um, a lot of the history of the institution was also told by other Black publications during that time. And so the, the Chicago Defender um, has a lot of um, articles and such that, that demonstrates and talks about that, that tension and that transition within the institution as well within the surrounding community. And the picture that you see on your left is um, actually uh, photos that were taken um, by um, uh, a folks at uh, the university during the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the protest that happened in Springfield where students from Chicago State University went to Springfield as well as other students across the state to, you know, to, to, to put pressure on uh, legislators for, you know, during the budget impasse. The budget impasse severely impacted many universities, but, but really impacted Chicago State University. So the students in, were, were taking charge of their education and, and really combating what the public narrative was about the institution, that the institution was not worth saving. That was kind of the public, the public um, narrative that was being written. So the, the, many, the students, faculty, and staff took the reins on that narrative and went to Springfield to to fight and put pressure on uh, legislators to to get to a um, you know to to some type of solution for the institution. And, and although the state budget impasse lasted you know for some, several months after that point, that was a significant moment because there was some emergency funds that were released due to uh, that student activities. And so those are some of the, the, the that is kind of a, a bridge being gap with telling these type of uh, narratives, but also engaging the, the unique uh, material that are a part of the university, you know, again, especially with this newspaper and also as yearbooks, they had yearbooks as well. So those are things that people actually often um, engage with when they're learning more about, about the university and its, uh, and its history, especially during the latter uh, part of the 20th century. So um, again, Chicago State University has a unique place in Black Chicago history, and we have some noted, you know, alumni. Uh, one alum uh, alum is Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who is better known as the founder of the Jusaba Museum, and she uh, re she was a student of Chicago Teachers College. She was an active student, which you see um, you see her photo. Um, uh, this is how she looked, you know, um, you know when she was older. But on the right, you see the photo of her um, as a student. Um, she, she was Margaret Taylor at the at that time. And um, this is a picture of her in 1937, um, way before you know her time at the at the Art Institute, and then before her time of uh, founding the um, the what we now know as the Side Museum. What you see below her uh, student photo is actually a uh, it was a design. This is her design that she did for the yearbook of uh, 1937. So she was already an active artist and designer, and in, in, in using those skills and engaging with those skills as a student at CTC. Additionally, Chicago State uh, has a, uh, you know, the, has the great honor of having um, noted poet, um, author, uh, and educator Gwendolyn Brooks um, as a part of this history. Gwendolyn Brooks was the first uh, African American, or actually first Black person to uh, um, to win the Pulitzer, um, and she also was uh, the longest standing. Um, uh, Illinois Poet Laureate. Uh, she uh, was the last uh, last person to have that title for you know because it was a lifetime appointment, um, and she she held that position for a, a very a very long time. Um, and she also for the last ten years of her life was the distinguished professor of English at Chicago State University. So she um, so again she brought a lot of a lot of life a lot of energy to the institution and really amplified um, the the the. Uh, the, the black creative um, um, space and its in its place in the larger canon in in literature and, po and, and poetry and such. Um, her time at Chicago State also noted the um, the inauguration of the Black Writers Conference, uh, and that is a Chicago State uh, uh, staple, if you will, and it really is a, Chica a Chicago staple. Um, it was founded by um, by ha uh, Dr. Hakeem Adabudi, who also was a professor, distinguished professor of English at Chicago State, and he founded the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for um, for uh, African American uh, literature and creative writing, for Black literature and creative writing. 
And that um, the Black Writers Conference went on for a, a very long time, um, um, well over 20 years. And it was dormant for about 10 years, but we brought it back in 2018, along with the dedication of the uh, library being named after uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. So we are now the Gwendolyn Brooks Library. And uh, these these uh, still images are just uh, screenshots of videos. We have a we have every recording of the Black Writers Conference, which is just a, a rich, rich just treasure trove. Uh, we have some of the last appearances of some of the most noted scholars and uh, creative writers and, and literary scholars in, you know, in the country, uh, Black literary scholars. And um, what you see here is on the left is um, Amiri Baraka. And um, and then to your right, uh, that's uh, Professor Hakeem Adabudi. But we also have one of the last public appearances, Octavia Butler. It's just, it's just a really rich, great history. And I just, I get lost every time I, I, I look through and because we're in the process now of digitizing it and making it more readily available to the public. Well, we're so excited to see that brought back because, you know, as you shared, it is such a long standing and, and notable conference too. So yeah, yeah there's a, a lot there. Right. And these images are from uh, the pension collection, which will lead, start, start to lead us into our um, to the special collections of Chicago State. Um, this is, as you can see, many people recognize this is uh, Mayor Harold Washington. And uh, Chicago State University was a, 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 a like a, a, a place where many uh, politicians, but especially Harold Washington, he, he was at Chicago State a lot during both of his campaigns, uh, doing rallies there, um, holding community meetings, meeting with the community. And so uh, to the left, that's an uh, image of him speaking to the, uh, to the community and the student body in the Robinson Center at Chicago State. Um, and then to the left, this is um, an image of the, at, at that time, that, uh, that was the person in the middle in the center was Dr. Ayers. He was the president of Chicago State at the time. This is at the Palmer House. But again, Chicago State in it's, it's faculty, it's staff, and his administrators, at, especially uh, during the 80s, and, and even now, it's always been a place for the community to engage with, you know, with our community and city leaders. And this uh, also comes from the Pension Collection, but this uh, gentleman here is Lerone Bennett. And although this image is from the Pension Col Collection, Lerone Bennett was a proponent, uh, was one of the major supporters of Harold Washington. He also, you know, Lerone Bennett is just an amazing figure. He was a longtime editor of Ebony Magazine. He um, also is a noted, you know, historian. He wrote a seminal text called Before the Mayflower, which is a seminal text of African-American uh, scholarship, um, as African-American historical scholarship. And um, he, we are fortunate enough to have a collection of his, although I don't have many of the things uh, sca uh, scanned and digitized because we're still processing that collection, but we are very proud to be the home of, uh, of a collection from uh, that reflects the life and the, the great legacy of LeBron Bennett. And so that leads us to our special collections, and I'll try to get through really quickly because we don't have too much time left. Um, so as you, we have, you know, the lot here, Raquel, so yeah, in addition, part two. yeah, in addition to, you know, again, the rich history that in the rich uh, collection that we have that reflects the university's history, we have these um, these additional uh, collections, these special collections that re reflect, um, you know, the, the, the larger community in which the university inhabits. And I like to say that the university is a resident of the community. And you know, I think it's very important to, to, to that, that institutions do not see themselves, uh, uh, you know, removed from the community, but you are a part of the community. And so these collections reflect um, you know, reflect the larger community in which, which the university is a part of. So we have the Providence Hospital Collection, um, which, uh, and, I'll, and I'll have some, I'll get into uh, some of these a little bit later because I have some images, but we have the Providence Hospital Collection, which was the first, um, first hospital uh, founded and chartered by um, uh, African Americans. It was founded by Dr. Daniel Hill Williams. We have the Maxwell Street Collection, which is our only real West Side representation. And as a native West Side, I always got to make sure that I, I, I uh, you know, I mentioned the Maxwell Street Collection because that is an area that which we need to grow. Although CSU is a South Side institution, it serves the Chicago area, it serves the whole community. And many uh, West Side residents are alum and are students of the university. We also have the Thomas Worth Collection of, of um, African American uh, Kana. And so it is a collection of first public, first and second publication or rare publications of uh, uh, scholarship and writings about uh, the African American experience in, 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 in or by um, uh, African Americans. And it's a really rich collection. We also have the F.H. Hammurabi Robb and the House of Knowledge co collection, the Judge Eugene Pension collection, um, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus collection, and as I mentioned before, the Lerone Bennett Jr. collection. 
So th these images, I'll just kind of go through really quick of the of Providence Hospital. Uh, to the right is uh, one of the early buildings of um, Providence Hospital. And although Providence Hospital is a part of the Cook County Health System, we have the records of the original it, uh, you know, uh, the original iteration of Provident Hospital, which closed in the early 80s. Um, to the left is an image of Dr. Daniel Hell Williams. Again, not only is he the founder of Provident Hospital, but he also is an, a noted figure in science and medical history. He uh, is the second African, uh, this, he was the second person, but first African-American to perform, a, um, I, I always mess up the type of surgery, but it was a type of open heart surgery, which was, you know, significant at the time. Um, and then, uh, Emma Reynolds, she went on to become a doctor, but she was, uh, it was her story that actually um, led Dan uh, Dr. Daniel Hill Williams to uh, to start the process of founding this hospital because she was looking to to become a nurse. She wanted to enroll in um, one of the nursing schools in Chicago and she was denied because she was a black woman. And so um, her cousin who was a preacher on the West side actually knew Dr. Dr. Williams and connected them and, and it's through her story and through that journey of her wanting to be trained that he started the, he, uh, started the uh, hospital and the, and the training school. And so we have some pictures here again of, of uh, nurses that were participating in the Red Cross uh, effort uh, campaign, and then we also have nurses on the right being being trained. Providence Hospital uh, at one point had had trained most of the uh, Black healthcare professionals, particularly doctors and and, and especially nurses, um, um, for a very uh, large part of the 20th century. So it's a very significant um, institution in, in history, not just for Black history, but you know in history in general. And then also to these unique treasures in the, the collection too. Um, there were, you know, different campaigns and funds and fundraisers and such happened to support the hospital. And so to your left, you, you have to take Kennedy there that came for a, uh, for a political campaign. And, and there was a, you know, a, like a fundraiser event. And so we have a couple of photos of him and other politicians in this collection. And also too, we have, there was a, a Josephine Baker. She was, um, uh, it, it did a, a performance for a fundraiser. And so we have all these wonderful, beautiful photos of her. And we actually had a community member who actually was my school librarian in high school who visited the archive and was able to actually help me identify the date because she knew Josephine Baker and had dinner with her during that visit. So that was, uh, I had a picture up and she just walked and was like, I remember when she came. So that was, that was really great. And uh, so now the Thomas Worth collection, again, um, this is a, it's a massive collection of books uh, dating from the, the uh, 1700s onto the to the mid uh, 20th century. And uh, some of the noted um, things that we have in the collection are first publications, uh, Phyllis Wheatley's um, uh, bu a book of poems uh, on various subjects. We also have a first edition of um, Frederick Douglass, My Bondage, My, My Freedom, and then also first publication of Solomon Northrup's uh, 12 Years a Slave. And these are very uh, uh, valuable um, uh, materials um, because, it, you know, again, those first publications give you a reflection of not only the original iteration of the storyteller, but context of the historical times. And um, actually, Phyllis Wheatley is the, that poem, Book of Poetry, is the oldest item that we have in our collection because she published, um, that was published in 1778, I believe, the same year as her, uh, her munition, uh, her release from, from, from bondage, if you will. So um, very special collection that we have there. And then the House of Knowledge collection is such a beautiful collection because it, it, it so uh, F.H. F. Hammurabi Robb was, um, he was a, a, a local community scholar and he, um, he was, um, uh, also the leader of the Chicago chapter of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which is, if people are familiar with that, that's more associated with the, that's the organization that Marcus Garvey founded. And so he uh, was the, the president of the Chicago chapter. He brought many people, many um, um, international scholars, especially from the continent to Chicago, and he founded what is called the House of Knowledge. So he, he researched and wrote um, scholarly articles in his own publication about Black history, not just in Chicago, but mainly the Beyond. And, and, uh, and that was very unique for the early 20th century before the subject matter of, if you will, Black history or African-American history. But it's also this really rich collection that gives this nice snapshot of uh, parts of the South Side of Bronzeville. It's just, it's just a really rich collection. I can't wait till we can really get it digitized and processed and, and made available to the public. 
Um, and then we have Maxwell Street. Uh, the, the collection is a photograph collection that was, you know, uh, taken by Steve Balkan. Steve Balkan is a professor, was a professor emeritus um, uh, from Roosevelt University. And the, the collection was originally called the Steve Balkan Collection, but he has been adamant about us keeping it the Maxwell Street Collection so that, but his collection is the founding collection of the Maxwell Street Collection. And it is a growing, it is a growing collection because there are other people that are interested in, in, doc, in donating what they've documented for Maxwell Street, but it largely uh, documents the last days of Maxwell Street. For those of us who are from Chicago and know, you know, the area, the, the, you know, the area of Maxwell Street is colloquially known, and he, and he, it, Steve has given me permission to use this term, it's colloquially known as, as Jewtown, and he, um, and it, what he did when the when the when a lot of the demolition and stuff was happening, they were basically fighting uh, a community organization, the Maxwell Street, you know, um, um, uh, organization, they were fighting to keep a lot of the businesses there because it was generations of businesses that, that actually that trend. It was a, it's a unique history where it was a largely a Jewish population and many uh, business owners. And then as a transition to um, a, a collection that just, I mean, a community that included lot, lot, you know, Latinx and, 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 and Black folks and all types of folks, just this, this melting pot of people in the city. Um, a lot of the business transitioned to many African Americans who had, who, who were probably longtime employees and such. And so it's this, it was this really unique history that that wasn't really documented and it was really being uh, was going to be lost um, because of the you know uh, with the expansion of you know UIC and that sort of thing so he just you know started you know collecting what he could from different businesses and taking photos just you know on his own and it's a very large and massive collection he took photos of everything and it really does give you the vibe and the energy of Maxwell Street I know the Maxwell Street that I grew up with because you know that's where you went to go get just your, your Easter outfit you would go to the market you would go you know you would go buy get a anything there anything you could buy anything there <laughs> so uh we have uh, this great photo of the Maxwell Street in Halstead um uh street signs uh and then there's a street performer um, and many photos of the street performance, but it also is a part of this blues history as well of Chicago, because many blues players would go down to Maxwell Street after sets and, you know, and such. And so uh, a lot of those as well. Um, and then just, you know, again, these are just some photographs of like some of the street art that was there uh, and just community members engaging uh, with Maxwell Street. And then this is just kind of, you know, a couple of exhibits and just, uh, this is one of the exhibits that we did for the Pinchum Collection. Um, uh, judge Eugene Pinchum was a, you know, again, a, a noted judge in the Chicago area. And he, um, you know, at the time as a litigator, he uh, was the litigator for a lot of, you know, noted, noted um, um, you know, cases. Uh, one that I, I remember him from when I was a child, and I didn't realize I would be handling his collection. Was there was a there was he got two uh, boys who were innocent of murder. He got them exonerated because they were they were children that were actually going to be charged for murder as adults. And so that really started to change the narrative about uh, police interrogation of children, and um, and just brought a lot of the social injustices that does exist in our um, in our, uh, our our system. And so he was one of the he was the Lead attorney that got those boys exonerated, but there, there's so many much, there's so much more to his uh, to his history as well because he did bring a social judgment, social justice element into his judgeship. And then um, again, these are just a hodgepodge of things on the that lower right, that lower left part. Um, we were engaging, and I can go to the next uh, slide. We were engaging a uh, solidarity and self determination, engaging the history of the Black Panther Party, um, and also we, and so a lot of ways that we activate our collection is through public programming. And so we did this wonderful program. Uh, Solidarity and self-determination, where we had a conversation with with mem mem uh, former members of the Black Panther Party, the Illinois chapter, just around the time they were celebrating the 50th um, year of its founding, and also acknowledging the the murder of Fred Hampton, uh, uh, Chairman of uh, Deputy Chairman of Fred Hampton, and um, it, we, there was also a conversation with the Young Lords and really bring it to fore that history of the Black Panther Party in terms of developing community coalition, and that's something that often does not get talked about in that history, and so we pulled out some things in the archive that actually spoke to that type of narrative. And, um, and then to the, I'm sorry, my alarm's went off. And then to the um, right, we had this wonderful program with the Smith, that was a part of our, um, our community um, uh, engagement program with the Smithsonian Giants Among Us, where we, it was this wonderful conversation between the children of Lerone Bennett and uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Nora Brooks Blakely and Joy Bennett. And they talked about this wonderful uh, friendship between their parents um, and how they support each other in community in their work. And so um, 
I, those, those are the things I love to do. I love to really bring the community in to the history and have, converse, have the community have conversations with our collections. And so that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> If, you know, I think you you nailed it, Raquel, in terms of Chicago State and its association um, of the community and that reflection and be able to capture those times in the archives, too. I mean, we're so, it, we'll look forward, and I'm sure our listeners will, to see more um, in the Explore portal um, mm -hmm. on your collection. Um, but I know we're just scratching the surface on your collection, but thanks so much for um for taking time to dive in a little bit in terms of not only the resources there, but you know the, the rich history of Chicago State University. And if you have any collect questions for Chicago Collections or any questions for Raquel, please um, reach out at um, these addresses provided here. But thank you so much for um, joining us today. And Raquel, many thanks for the work that you're doing and your, your team at Chicago State. Thank you, thank you for, for having me.